when I was graduating from Bucknell with a degree in animal behavior, um, you know, I had a decision to make, you know, was I interested in getting a PhD and in exploring the sciences further? And I, I realized pretty quickly that I had skills and talents that could really be used in the conservation world. And that I decided not to pursue a PhD because I felt like I didn't want to go down the route of being super um, specific for you know, the rest of my career. I wanted to engage with people. And I then decided to go to Duke University, pursue a master's in environmental management. And at the same time as I was doing that, uh, that was when my parents were able to make their first moves over to the Eastern Shore. And so I was introduced to the Eastern Shore of Maryland much more solidly uh, while I was pursuing that degree, that, that master's degree. That is where I was introduced to more of the conservation world um, while my parents, um, Tim and Kristen Junkin, uh, founded Midshore Riverkeeper Conservancy. And so that was my introduction to the Riverkeeper movement. And then right in, you know, in sort of in the middle of my uh, degree at Duke, I um, got the job with Chester River Association. Yes, my parents were so integral in instilling that love of nature in me and then introducing me to the Eastern Shore, introducing me to the Riverkeeper movement and starting uh, you know, the Midshore Riverkeeper Conservancy, which was an amazing um, group and you know, was, was the youngest of the three um, uh, legacy organizations and a very impactful organization. Working for Chester River Association, it was so fun to be a partner organization and working with my parents and the staff that they had cultivated. And then the opportunity to then merge was just so exciting as a way to bring everything together and really feel like what my parents had started, what I had pursued a degree in was really coming to fruition and felt like it was really starting to make a big difference. Back in 2011, I was hired as the policy director for the Chester River Association, which was focusing on water quality and improving water quality solely in the Chester River. Um, I was policy director for about two years, working a lot in Annapolis on, on town and county um, legislative and enforcement and advocacy issues. Then I became Chester Riverkeeper for four years. Um, and then we merged uh, with Sassafras River Association and Midshore Riverkeeper Conservancy and became Shore Rivers. We all had river keepers. We all worked on the same pollution issues. So agricultural pollution, um, legacy nutrients and sediments in our waterways, you know, outdated septic systems and wastewater treatment plants, lawn fertilizer, stormwater runoff from our, our very historic towns. Um, so we were working on the same sources of pollution and we had the same strategies, education, advocacy, and restoration. So we really started to coalesce around this idea of merging into one entity that would allow us to have a greater presence and a greater voice at the state level and at the regional level in the Chesapeake Bay, but still allow us to have that really strong grassroots foundation, um, which is really the foundation and the roots of where river keepers come from. So when we merged in 2018, we were merging three organizations. We had three office locations that we kept uh, and three staff and three staff cultures. And it was a lot of fun and a lot of work in that first year and still is. Uh, when we first merged in 2018, we had about maybe 15, 16 staff members. Uh, we have now since grown. We have, I think, 25 or 26 staff. Um, so in, you know, in our fourth year now, we have been able to grow the number of professionals uh, that, that are working on the ground for clean water. Um, and we've been able to achieve some of those efficiencies of scale where we have one executive director instead of three. I'd say one of the really fun things was, was coming together as a membership and as the the people who support Shore Rivers and who had previously supported our legacy organizations and having them see over the past few years how strong we've become as an organization and how much more we're able to do and how together you know, we're greater than the sum of our parts. Shore Rivers specifically um, was very purposeful, um, even starting as early as 2019, really starting to think about um, how we wanted to grow as an organization. And we had been through so much change since 2018, since merging these three organizations. 
we had been through so much change, we wanted continuity and we wanted stability. We wanted that knowledge, um, that, that continuation of knowledge and of ability at that executive director leadership level. So I'm really glad we did because we set ourselves up for this transition in this leadership position that ended up happening right in the middle of COVID. And I can't imagine what, would, what it would have been like as a staff person working at Shore Rivers, um, un, you know, having COVID and the pandemic on top of a brand new leader who is unfamiliar to the staff and unfamiliar to the organization. And we've so been able to really dig into our programming and our staff and our fundraising efforts and make sure that we continue to do the important work of working for clean water and that we haven't been sidetracked by the pandemic. We've been fortunate. We haven't had to lay off any staff or furlough anyone. So my specific goals are really working on access and working on fundraising and making sure that we are a strong organization from the financial standpoint so that we can go out into our community and engage with people and really get this work done. So access is this umbrella term that uh, we have been using this year and really digging into. Access is physical physical access to our waterways via boat ramps, um, public beaches, community beaches, um, even access via a county owned road that bumps up against a tidal marsh or a tidal creek where one can slip a canoe in, which is so important to people then building the love for the waterways that they need in order to have the drive to make behavior changes so that we can actually clean up our waterways. Um, access also means it's informational, so access to information on the health of our waterways. So this is, can people find the information that we're putting out on our bacteria testing program? Do they know the, the information that's out there, the data um, about how coming into contact with our water could affect their health? Um, are there, is there signage out? Are we accessible? Is there, access to the information about how to get into our rivers and are they healthy um, for, for our contact. Uh, and then access, thirdly, access is also regulatory. So do our town and county and state regulations facilitate and promote and support access to our waterways? So the way that manifests itself is through like county comprehensive plan processes or zoning, uh, you know, zoning and planning processes. So, you know, when our counties undergo comprehensive planning, that's where community members come together and say, this is what we want our county to promote um, in the next 10 year comprehensive plan timeframe. And, you know, we want more people saying, we want more public access points. We want you to support walkable towns and walkable waterfronts. So that regulatory access, and that is really where our river keepers come in because our regulatory processes for a lot of people are very obtuse and difficult to engage in. And river keepers are the voice for their river. They are representing the commons, the, the natural resources that everyone owns. And so, so access for us, again, it's, you know, it's informational, it's physical access to waterways and it's regulatory. And really it's making sure that everyone in all of our communities has equitable access to clean water and to healthy waterways.